and we look forward for your active participation, and we wish you all the success. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Excellency. Now we are delighted to have a special address from His Excellency Isa Kadam, Governor of Dubai International Financial Center. Please welcome him to the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good morning. It is indeed an honor to be among you today for the inauguration of the 10th session of the World Islamic Economic Forum 2014. Choosing Dubai to host this prestigious forum is undoubtedly an indication of the UAE's growing presence in the global Islamic economy landscape. Since the launch of Dubai's initiative to become the capital of Islamic economy, the UAE has stepped up its efforts in the Islamic finance sector. With the establishment of the Dubai Islamic Economy Development Center in 2013, we have begun witnessing growth across the various sectors that represent Dubai's strategy for, a, for an Islamic economy. Islamic finance is a key pillar of Dubai's capital of Islamic economy vision and an area of expertise in Dubai's financial sector. Fueled by booming industries in the GCC and Southeast Asia, the Islamic finance industry is booming. Forecast estimate, it will double over the next five years to more than 3.4 trillion US dollars. 2014 has also proved a watershed year for the sovereign scoop, with several countries around the world tapping into the market the importance of scoop as a significant instrument in Islamic finance can no longer be ignored. The success and development of the Islamic finance industry in Dubai has been led by the growth in Sukuk listing. Dubai has earned its position as the third global center for Sukuk, following the recent listing of 750 million US dollars Sukuk by the government of Dubai, as well as plans by the government of Hong Kong to list its to list its first successful offering of $1 billion US dollars, Sukuk, on NASDAQ Dubai. Experts affirm that the global Sukuk market must see more issuances from conventional financial hubs in order to sustain its growth and momentum. It is estimated that the Sukuk market is likely to sustain double-digit growth in the next three years, with assets in Islamic finance expected to reach $2.8 trillion US dollars by 2015. It is estimated that total sovereign Sukuk outstanding now accounts for more than 36% of the 296 billion US dollars of outstanding Sukuk as of July 2014. Moreover, it is expected sovereign Sukuk issuance will exceed 2013 level to reach around 30 billion US dollars by year in 2014, with the overall outstanding amount set to reach 115 billion US dollars and supported by continued expansion in the number of Sukuk issuing governments through 2015. Growth in Sukuk reflects the increasing efforts initiated by the governments of Muslim countries to support Islamic banking and finance, in line with the cultural and religious affinity of their citizens. We are confident that new Islamic and non-Islamic sovereign issuers will continue to enter in the market as the call for an Islamic economy gains resonance. The UAE, as well as other member countries of the GCC, will attract more global investors and drive an increasing proportion of cross-border hard currency sukuk issuances in the long term. We strongly believe that the global financial crisis generated greater awareness worldwide for the advantages of long-term funding options. Investors around the world decided to diversify their portfolios and invest in credit that they would not otherwise have access to, such as Islamic institutions, which only raise funds in a Sharia-compliant manner. The future of the Sukuk market is one of innovation, where new assets, structures, 
and markets continue to, gen to create enhanced opportunities for investors. Based on our experience and deal flow from 2013 and first half of 2014, we expect to see main trends continue to develop in the Sukuk market, longer term funding, growth in cross-border Sukuk, and the issuance of innovative Sukuk for the, for the purposes of raising capital that proved to generate significant investor interest among, the, among both conventional and Islamic investors. Looking ahead, we can safely say that Dubai is well poised to become the capital of Islamic economy, in addition to accelerating efforts to reinforce the Emirates position in strategic Islamic sectors, we will witness a substantial growth in Sukuk issuance. After all, as Frank Kane, a prominent journalist residing in the UAE, once observed, this is Dubai, where the difficult is done immediately and the impossible takes only a little longer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and wish you all, you, all of you a productive conference. Thank you, Excellency. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call the Honorable Dr. Zeti Akhtar Aziz, Governor of the Central Bank of Malaysia, His Excellency Kairat Kalimbitov, Governor of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, Mrs. Andrea Leedsum, Member of Parliament and Economic Secretary to the UK Treasury, Masood Ahmed, Director of Middle East and Central Asia Department of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Abdul Aziz Al Hinai, Vice President Finance of Islamic Development Bank, and Mushtaq Parker, editor of Islamic Banker Magazine, to join us on the stage. Now please welcome the Honorable Dr. Zeti Akhtar Aziz, Governor of the Central Bank of Malaysia, to give her special address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honor and pleasure to be here in Dubai at this World Islamic Economic Forum 2014 to speak at this dialogue session on the potential of the Sukuk market and its role in the economic development process and contributing towards financial stability. This recent decade has witnessed the accelerated development of the global Sukuk market. The global Sukuk market has now reached 270 billion US dollars outstanding and is evolving to become a distinct platform for fostering greater international economic and financial linkages. The success of the Sukuk market reflects its ability to meet the changing and differentiated demands of the modern economy, to develop innovative and cutting-edge structures and products, and to achieve such issuance at competitive pricing. The Sukuk market has drawn increasing interest from sovereigns, multilateral institutions, multinational and national corporations, both from developed and emerging economies to finance investments in a wide range 
of economic activities and development projects. The geographical reach of the Sukuk market has also become more extensive, with the global Sukuk outstanding now being domiciled in more than 20 countries, while the investor base spans from Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. In addition to issuance in the international reserve currencies that include the US dollar, the British pound, and the euro, more recently in Malaysia has been the issuance of sukuk in renminbi. For investors, the sukuk offers the diversification into multiple asset classes and different techniques used to structure medium to long-term instruments. Given that the sukuk is based on underlying assets, it discourages overexposure of the financing beyond the value of the underlying assets. Issuers are thus discouraged from leveraging in excess of the asset value. The prospect of over-indebtedness and its consequences on financial stability is reduced. There is also potential for direct participation of investors in the project, thereby granting investors beneficial ownership in the underlying assets, with the rights to receive a share of profits or rental income from the underlying assets of the sukuk while taking the associated risks of such ownership. The sovereign sukuk is generally the first inroad to Sharia compliant funding in the capital market, enabling the, the creation of reference prices over time to which the private sector entities can benchmark their fundraising activities. Governments have for the most part remained the most active issuers in the history of the global sukuk market, with sovereign issuance now accounting for more than 80% of the global sukuk issuance. The recent few, this recent few years has also seen a number of jurisdictions in developed economies strengthen their legal, regulatory, and governance framework to facilitate such sukuk issuance. And this is indeed a very encouraging development. Going forward, the financing requirements for economic development are envisaged to be massive, particularly for emerging and developing economies in the Asian and Middle Eastern regions that are seeking huge amounts of capital to fund new infrastructure and to support economic development. Given the sheer size of these projects, equity and government budgets cannot be the only source of financing for this next phase of economic growth and industrialization in our regions. The Sukuk market has become a potentially important new source of funding for such long-term projects. In the recent decade, a total of 95 billion US dollars of infrastructure Sukuk has been issued by more than 10 different countries. In Asia, it is estimated that a funding of 8.3 trillion US dollars is required until 2020 for infrastructure projects, while funding requirements in the Middle East are estimated to be 2 trillion over the same period. Developing economies in Africa have also already begun to end its entry into the Sukuk market for such infrastructure financing with some having put in place the legal groundwork for such sukuk issuance. However, low sovereign ratings have limited the ability of certain high-growth developing countries to source such funding despite being rich in natural resources. Countries that are rich in natural resources may, however, pledge these resources for such issuance. Funding may thus be secured arising from the securitization of such assets given the recourse to assets by the assets by investors. It provides the incentives for disciplined and appropriate governance of the management of these projects. Additionally, 
Multilateral development banks may also facilitate this process by providing credit guarantees to these countries to reduce the financing costs and improve the quality of the suku issuance. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to share Malaysia's experience in the development of the Sukuk market and in our Islamic finance marketplace. The Islamic capital market in Malaysia has been systematically developed to ensure accessibility while ensuring protection of investors and efficiency in the intermediation process. The initiatives to develop the market are also strongly backed by legal and Sharia framework, which further support is supported by a robust financial infrastructure, including the settlement and bond information system that enables Malaysia to provide a complete sukuk issuance and trading platform. Since the first Sukuk issuance in 1990 by multilateral co corporation, multinational corporation, the Sukuk outstanding in Malaysia's marketplace is now 158 billion US dollars. And in 2002, the Malaysian government issued its first inaugural global sovereign Sukuk, and which became the f an international benchmark for the issuance of global sovereign Sukuk. The marketplace has now been liberalized to allow multilateral financial institutions, multinational and national corporations from other jurisdictions to issue both ringgit and non-ringgit denominated sukuk in our market. And with increasing foreign investor participation in such issuances. The sukuk market in Malaysia has been wide-ranging, seen wide-ranging and innovative structures and a greater diversity in the type of maturity of the sukuk. A landmark issuance in, uh, of 750 US dollars exchangeable sukuk musharaka in 2006 by Kazana, the government's investment corporation for the purpose of selling a stake in uh, our telecommunications corporation. It marked the first issuance of its kind incorporating full convertibility features common to conventional equity link transactions. A more notable issuance was, uh, that was pioneering retail exchange traded Sukuk to raise funds for a transportation project that allowed retail investors the opportunity to have direct access to Sukuk and thus a stake in uh, massive infrastructure development of the country. In terms of maturity, the Ringgit Sukuk market has seen issuance of maturities to 30 years, which has been well received by the market. And regular issuance with different maturities by the Malaysian government has also created a benchmark yield curve uh, for the market as a reference. In complementing the Sukuk market as a source of funds raising also has been explored by uh, other funding channels to assist small and medium scale enterprises, new growth industries and entrepreneurs that have limited access to the Sukuk market. An increasing as a, in an increasingly internationalized global financial marketplace that has generated cross-border flows, one of the requirements that we as we advance forward is for more tradable cross-border Islamic finance financial instruments that can cater to the different profiling of investors' risk appetites. The issuance of short-term sukuk by the International Islamic Liquidity Management Corporation, IILM, is a breakthrough in the innovation towards increasing cross-border liquidity flows that could potentially enhance financial stability and the efficient functioning of Islamic financial markets.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude my remarks. There is a clear indication of the growing relevance and importance of the Sukuk market with the growing interest from both emerging and developed jurisdictions and the strategic approaches taken to diversify the funding sources through the Sukuk market. The overall direction and potential of the global sukuk market are certainly well recognized, particularly in its role towards contributing to greater economic development. There is a significant potential for the sukuk market in particular to fund infrastructure projects, and this is particularly relevant for the GCC, African and Asian regions. This would contribute towards building deeper and more liquid and efficient and effective global sukuk markets. The dynamism of the sukuk market also contributes towards strengthening financial stability and in facilitating the expansion of inter-regional investment flows. As we move towards increasing this internationalization of Islamic finance and thus towards greater global financial integration, it will contribute towards global growth process and financial stability that will be mutually reinforcing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now, please welcome His Excellency Karat Kelimbitov, Governor of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, for his special address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you on behalf of the National Bank of Kazakhstan at the session dialogue on Sukuk development on the 10th World Islamic Economic Forum. I would like to express gratitude. Brief uh, background in the current economic situation environment. The GDP uh, last year achieved 20, uh, uh, 220 billion US dollars, and average economic growth was about uh, last five years about 5 percent. International reserve of the country exceeded 100 billion US dollars. Uh, we, uh, we've got independence more than 20 years ago, and over the uh, two decades, we established a, a leading financial, uh, conventional financial hub in the region. And at the same time, we were very excited of the opportunity of development Islamic financing in Kazakhstan. Recently, uh, just recently, the governor Zeti mentioned about uh, very impressive growth of Sukuk market in the world. And uh, such a promising market was one of the main reasons why Kazakhstan in 2009 start, uh, in addition to the traditional pattern, start uh, development of Islamic finance in the country. In 2010, in his annual address to the people, His Excellency President of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, in his speech, New Decade, uh, New Economic Growth and New Opportunity, noted the need of becoming Kazakhstan, like uh, an Almaty, one of the top 10 financial centers in Asia and as a hub of Islamic finance in the region of Central Asia and CIS. With this mind, National Bank of Kazakhstan and the other government bodies are actively working on the establishment of legal framework, development of Islamic finance infrastructure, as well as the increase of the level of awareness about this area among the population. In 2009 and further in 2011, Kazakhstan was the first in the region to adopt laws which make it possible to issue Islamic security sukuk and put them in circulation. Islamic list certificates and Islamic participation certificates, issuance of the government Islamic securities and expanding the list of the corporate issuers of the Islamic securities. Moreover, these laws provide opportunity to establish Islamic investment fund. Thus, it should be noted that currently Kazakhstan has a chance to become a regional platform for the issuance and circulation of the Islamic security sukuk for the Central Asia region and CIS. The government of the Republic of Kazakhstan has approved the roadmap of development of Islamic finance until 2020, whose implementation contributes to the creation of uh, 
of conditions for stable development of the Islamic financial services industry, creating a critical mass of issuers, investors, and market participants. In 2011, the National Bank of Kazakhstan was admitted to the Islamic Financial Service Board, uh, IFSB, as an associated member. This enabled us to receive effective assistance for the development of prudential standards for the Islamic Financial Organization of Kazakhstan. Moreover, it is next year that Kazakhstan, as the first country in the CIS and Central Asia, is going to host an IFSB summit. In this regard, I would like to invite you, dear guests, to participate in the 12th IFSB summit, which we, is organized by the IFSB in cooperation with the National Bank of Kazakhstan next year in Almaty. The summit will gather the world leading experts and financial institutions in the field of Islamic finance. I, uh, I would also like to say that in the very near future, the National Bank of Kazakhstan is going to join the accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions and the international Islamic financial market. In order to improve the legislation in the field of accounting and auditing of Islamic financial institutions, as well as introducing Islamic money market instruments to manage liquidity in the domestic Islamic financial system. In addition, it's necessary to mention that as a part of the ongoing efforts to further develop of Islamic financial sector and unlock the full potential of Islamic finance in facilitating economic development of Kazakhstan, the Islamic Development Bank is providing a technical assistance to the National Bank of Kazakhstan. Under this assistance, world leading experts will be hired to further amend Kazakhstan's legislative framework. Taking into account all mentioned above, I would uh, like to, uh, to say that today Kazakhstan serves as a gate for penetration of Islamic finance to the region of Central Asia and CIS. Today, there are a number of Islamic financial institutions in Kazakhstan. Uh, this is the first Islamic bank, Al-Hilal, and the first Islamic insurance company. In addition, in 2014, with participation of the ICD, uh, Ijara Leasing Company was opened in Kazakhstan. In, <clears throat> in 2012, the National Bank of Kazakhstan issued the, all the necessary permits to the Development Bank of Kazakhstan for the issuance and selling of Sukuk. And in July to, uh, 2012, the Development Bank of Kazakhstan became the first issuer in the region, which has uh, successfully implemented the transaction of the issuance of Islamic bond Sukuk al uh, Murabaha, amounting to 76 million US dollars. 60% of this issue was distributed among foreign investors. Malaysian company REM Rating uh, Service has assigned the Development Bank of Kazakhstan AA2 ratings, allowing this Kazakhstani bank to position itself at the same level with uh, RBS uh, Berhad. In October this year, the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Kazakhstan, after uh, the break, placed the euro bonds totaling 2.5 billion US dollars. Investors have shown a very high interest in Kazakhstan sovereign euro bonds as the total book claimed exceeded 11 billion US dollars. In this regard, and taking in account that we have all necessary laws and regulation, I think it is logically correct to use such a high investor interest in the sovereign securities of Kazakhstan to issue sovereign or quasi-sovereign sukuk in the next year, as did the United Kingdom and Hong Kong. The global experience is, has shown that the lack of a well-developed bond, um, bond market, uh, markets may result in overdependence on uh, financing from the banking sector, which in return may result in funding mismatch with some negative effect on financial stability. The bond market, especially Sukuk market, due to its nature, allows access to funding with appropriate maturities, those avoiding the funding mismatches. The main future of Sukuk is that its funding is designed to project financing, which has real economic benefits, rather than the financing speculative activities. Those development of Sukuk market contributes to more durable financial stability. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a much room for discussion and big potential for Islamic economic development worldwide. I wish you all fruitful cooperation and effective discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Excellency. Finally, please welcome Mrs. Andrea Leedsom, Member of Parliament and Economic Secretary to the UK Treasury for her special address.
Good morning, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests. It's a huge pleasure to be here in Dubai this morning. The city has gone through an incredible transformation over the last 50 years. This transformation, which has been fueled by natural resources, tourism, retail, trade, and finance, is nothing short of astounding. And I can tell you, you've even attracted my brother and his wife to come and live here. So congratulations for that. <laughs> And it sends a very powerful message that the fast-growing financial powerhouses of today are increasingly located away from the traditional hubs of Western Europe and the United States. Nowhere is this more the case than in the world of Islamic finance, clearly demonstrated by the palpable ambition in this room. Ambition to make the most of the opportunities offered by a market enjoying year-on-year -year growth of 40% since 2005, and which at the current rate of growth will exceed two trillion US dollars in assets by the end of this year. My position as the city minister in the government of the United Kingdom is simple. We are also ambitious. Our policy is one of open, willing engagement with fast-growing economies, such as those in the Islamic world. And the UK is not in competition with those economies. Our aim is to work together to grow this market throughout the world. And having listened to Governor Zeti just now and what she has helped to achieve in Malaysia, I can see what a long way the UK has still to go. But by maintaining and expanding our position as the Western hub for Islamic finance, I do believe that London can be proud in the world as a leading centre. We believe that the UK has a great deal to offer your fast-growing market. So today I will talk about the actions we are taking in the UK to make that a reality. My first point is that there are already several factors that make the UK a good place to do business in this area. Our time zone means that we sit at the center of global capital markets. English is the global language of business. Our professional services industry has significant expertise in Islamic finance, including more than 25 law firms with is Islamic specialist departments. We have world-class academic institutions offering specialized training courses and qualifications. And I'm delighted that just last year, we set up 10 new Chevening scholarships for Islamic finance in the UK. And of course, we benefit from a talented, highly educated, multilingual, multicultural workforce. My second point is that you should judge us by our actions. The UK has already put in place a suite of policies to help solidify the UK's position as a global partner and destination of choice for Islamic finance. This time last year, London hosted the first World Islamic Economic Forum outside of the Islamic world, a resounding success with 1,800 political and business leaders from over 115 countries in attendance. We made a number of significant commitments then to make the UK a partner of choice for Islamic finance, and we have delivered on those commitments. We've created an Islamic index on the London Stock Exchange. We've seen the launch of the first Islamic insurance underwriting agency, Cobalt Underwriting. The London Market Group, which sits within Lloyd's of London, has also developed a trade body, the Islamic Insurance Association, to look specifically at developing UK expertise in Islamic insurance. We have continued work on setting up Islamic compliant students and startup loans. And six months ago, we had the inaugural meeting of the Global Islamic Finance and Investment Group, GIFIG, in London, that was chaired by Baroness Warsi. This group brings together premiers, ministers, CEOs of major Islamic banks, central bank governors and regulators, people who can make a real difference to the global landscape, to examine the key global opportunities and barriers facing Islamic finance. We've done this because the UK believes in this industry's great international future. And we will continue to work with you to help to develop it. 
But our landmark announcement at last year's WIEF was promising to be the first Western country to issue sovereign sukuk. And in June this year, we delivered on that promise. We issued 200 million pounds of sovereign sukuk and orders for the issuance totaled 2.3 billion pounds. That's nearly 12 times oversubscribed. This was the culmination of years of hard work to create the right tax and regulatory environment, one which puts Islamic finance on a par with conventional finance, creating a level playing field for Islamic financial products. And I hope that this achievement inspires further issuances of sukuk by corporates as the Islamic finance industry in the UK continues to expand. I would now like to talk a little bit about where I see the UK market developing and the opportunities that that means for you. One development we expect to see over the next quarter is the move into the Sukuk market by UK Export Finance, UKEF, which is the UK's export credit agency. Since the global financial crisis, UKEF's 100% guarantee product played a key role in supporting customers of Airbus aircraft and Rolls-Royce engines. A UKEF guaranteed Islamic Sukuk product is a natural step to extend the scope and appeal of this guarantee. UKEF expects to bring its first guaranteed Sukuk to market in the new year in support of an Airbus customer the first Sukuk for an ECA-backed aviation transaction and a significant step forward in UKEF's existing work with a wide range of airlines from the Islamic world. Like conventional capital markets guarantees, it will be available for use in a range of currencies to suit all customers. And our indications are that given the confidence the market has in both the strength of the UK EF guarantee and the principles of Sharia financing, its pricing would be consistent with the conventional capital markets product. Our ambition is that this Sukuk product will be rolled out to a range of other customers and sectors. The second area of significant development in the British market is and will continue to be infrastructure. The last few years have seen some flagship developments in the UK that have been funded or part funded by Islamic finance. To give just one example, Qatari DR's investment in Chelsea Barracks represents the largest Islamic finance deal anywhere in Europe ever. And over the coming years, it is in infrastructure that the UK will be seeking significant further inward investment which UK trade and investment will be explaining in our country investment programme tomorrow. In housing alone in the UK, we need to build hundreds of thousands more units per year than we're currently doing, creating enormous opportunities for Islamic banks. 6,600 of those units in the North West and the Midlands regions are coming from a £700 million investment by Gatehouse Bank, a fully Sharia compliant bank. So my message to you is, over the coming years, I hope we will see billions worth of new investments from the Islamic world in a range of sectors in the UK, because it's good for us and good for you. So the third area I would like to touch on is Sharia compliant facilities. The Bank of England is very well aware that Islamic banks face real difficulties in meeting their liquidity requirements with the currently limited range of options. Its existing facilities, which involve interest-bearing activity, are not, of course, Sharia compliant. So I'm pleased to confirm that the Bank of England will begin feasibility work next year on establishing a Sharia compliant facility. This will, I'm afraid, not be a quick process, but the emphasis must be on getting it right. And that means we are looking at a project for the medium term. Nevertheless, I hope that you will see this endeavour as recognition from the UK's central bank of the challenges Islamic banks face in their liquidity management requirements. And it's another British vote of confidence in bringing Islamic finance into the mainstream. Because Sukuk, 
and the wider Islamic finance market will, I know, continue to flourish. And the United Kingdom is determined to continue working with you as you grow and expand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Leedsom. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now begin the first session, Dialogue on Sukuk Development and Financial Stability, moderated by Mushtaq Parker, editor of Islamic Banker magazine. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I start, I'd just like to thank the World Islamic Economic Forum and also the Dubai Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to moderate this uh, session. Um, Dubai always pulls the emotional strings because this is where it all began in 1975 with the establishment of uh, Dubai Islamic Bank. And uh, we are indebted to two remarkable leaders, uh, al marhum Sheikh Zayed uh, bin Sultan al Nahyan, the then President of the United Arab Emirates and also the ruler of Abu Dhabi. And of course, al marhum uh, Sheikh Rashid bin Said al uh, Al Maktoum, the then ruler of Dubai, for their foresight, and dare I say their courage for starting at that time, which was an experiment in Islamic finance. And look where we have come 30, 40 years uh, since then. Uh, the cycle has come full circle. Present ruler of uh, Dubai, His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Rashid Al Maktoum, has launched this initiative of Dubai as a global economy hub and also Dubai as an Islamic financial center with a special emphasis on uh, Dubai as a platform for Sukuk origination. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, it's very fitting for the 10th uh, forum to be held in Dubai in that respect. Uh, the title Sukuk Development and Financial Stability uh, is a very intriguing one. It conjures up two especially in our space, two important aspects is Sukuk development and, of course, financial stability. And financial stability is the, what's it, the hot topic, especially in the G20 uh, agenda, uh, G20 uh, agenda for regulatory reform. Um, in fact, it was the G20 which uh, mandated the International Monetary Fund and also the Financial Stability Forum. Uh, the vital task of restoring global financial stability, uh, thus making the system more resilient. And just very briefly, uh, you know, the, the efforts encompass the enhancement and resilience of financial institutions, the ending of too big to fail institutions, transforming shadow banking into transparent and resilient market-based financing, and of course, making the derivatives market safer, especially the OTC market. Um, there's also the connectivity to the Basel III process uh, framework, and, which is the cornerstone of resilience uh, through its new capital and liquidity frameworks. And just one mention, I think uh, uh, when the liquidity coverage ratio was uh, standard was introduced, I think at the beginning of 2013, for the very first time there was reference to the Islamic finance uh, market, uh, especially uh, for the inclusion of certain type of sukuk uh, under the high liquidity, uh, uh, HQ, high quality liquidity assets. And I think um, the, the LCR uh, comes in, came into effect this year, but I think it will be phased in by 2019. And I know there are some countries in the Muslim world that are uh, working towards including Sukuk in this uh, HQ LA universe. And I think the Basel process has left it up to individual regulators to decide which Sukuk qualify in that respect. Uh, of course, there's also the other...
adhere to the common compliance rules, <clears throat> enhance secondary market liquidity, and provide hedging, hedging instruments for better risk management that incorporate the concept of risk sharing because Islamic finance is about risk sharing. I would shed light on uh, what IDB is doing. In addition to the efforts by the IFSP and IOFI on, on this regard, I believe IDB is very much uh, continuing the efforts and to contribute by cooperating with its member countries. A good example is the reverse linkage program. We have been reverse linking good experiences from IDB member countries to IDB member countries. Definitely, uh, the financial centers is a, go a very good thing uh, to, to, to reverse link. And those countries who have already uh, have the experience, whether in Sukuk issuance or in the creating the enabling environment, we want to move these experiences to the less advanced member countries of IDB. So IDB will continue to contribute. However, there are issues that are, need to be really uh, taken into consideration. Issuing a sovereign sukuk is a good thing, but I believe priority, especially in the less advanced IDB member countries should be given to project-specific sukuk rather than sovereign sukuk. Because sovereign sukuk is always looked at as a debt instrument, whereas Islamic finance always encouraging productivity, and productivity can be seen on a project. A good example, why would a country go and issue a sovereign while there are very good bankable projects in the infrastructure? I will start by issuing for those uh, projects because the <coughs> investors will see that there is an income generating projects in the pipeline and where his money is invested are on those projects. But uh, for, for, for less developed countries, definitely that should be the start. This will also help reducing the cost to the <coughs> issuer because issuing uh, debt looked at by the investor to refinance debt or to spend on uh, subsidy, subsidizing the economy or subsidizing or, 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 or putting it in the budget deficit is definitely going to be costly. So I really think that uh, efforts should be devoted to infrastructure by pinpointing specific bankable projects and issue sukuk for those projects. Again, a sukuk should not be looked at as a debt because the owner, the holder of a suk is a shareholder in that project if it was issued for the project. So it should not be looked at a debt uh, instrument but rather uh, uh, an ownership in that uh, project, as I said. Those are mainly the, the issues that I wanted uh, to cover uh, from the previous speeches. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you. Um, I've just been told we've got 10 minutes for questions, at least so we're very pushed for time, but uh, we'll try our best. Um, the importance of public policy, you know, seems to be under stress in, 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 in the whole Islamic finance debate. And uh, we all know that without the requisite public policy in place, nothing happens in, in finance as in any other sector of, 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 of governance. Um, and uh, we see now emerging two trends. One, this question of uh, active sovereign uh, Sukuk issuance program, which the Governor Zeti you uh, referred to as the fir usually the first entry into that market. Um, but if you look at the, at the uh, landscape of uh, issuing countries, there are not many sovereign issuers, uh, especially from the OIC countries. Um, so first of all, what needs to be done in that respect, and, and as both in terms of public policy engagement and getting the right regulatory and legal frameworks and trust laws and all that in place. Um, of course, the IDB has issued, uh, the ISIC has issued the Sukuk issuance program, uh, I mean the uh, insurance program to help sovereigns, especially below investment grade, to come to the market as well. Uh, on the other hand, from what Abdulaziz is uh, alluding to, is that we need more, uh, if you like, project-based sukuk rather than sovereign 
perhaps he's alluding to local currency issuances in that respect as well, uh, to, 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 if you like, tag into the demand for, for projects and infrastructure funding. I'd like your, your view on this, uh, Dr. Sethi, if it's not. And also, if you'd like to respond to the, some of the points uh, brought up by the two discussants. Yes. Uh, well, the, the public policy is vital for mm. this, uh, to provide the enabling environment. Mm. Uh, but secondly, amongst the corporate sector, amongst the private sector, uh, is to have an awareness of what are the benefits and what are the advantages of issuing uh, sukuk, of financing uh, uh, projects uh, via the, the sukuk market. Uh, it requires understanding, it requires mm. expertise. And those advisories, for example, uh, um, uh, solicitors, accounting firms and all this, are the ones really who provide these advisory services over and above the financial intermediaries. Mm. And therefore, these are critical elements that will uh, result in greater participation. But first of all, uh, it's incumbent upon uh, the financial intermediaries and all these uh, uh, auxiliary uh, um, support services, professional services, uh, to provide that so that uh, um, uh, there would be greater interest uh, of the uh, ability of the sukuk market really to meet the differentiated requirements of the different types of investments and also the, the, um, uh, the competitiveness. That means that, for example, the sukuk that was issued uh, by the United Kingdom was at par with the conventional mm -hmm. issuances. Therefore, there's that advantage. We have competitive pricing. Uh, and these are the, th the elements that is less known. So, um, yes, but I believe that uh, after, especially uh, countries like the United Kingdom and Hong Kong, uh, non-Islamic countries that have ventured into uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, space, uh, it will result in future uh, issuance going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Governor Kalimbetov, uh, as a fairly new uh, entry into the Islamic finance space and the uh, emerging uh, market, uh, what are the main challenges for uh, you know, a jurisdiction like uh, Kazakhstan in terms of taking the Sukuk proposition you know, beyond just this? You, uh, you have a quasi-sovereign by the National uh, Development Bank of, of Kazakhstan. What do you need as an emerging uh, market? in terms of technical assistance, in terms of uh, market education, in terms of the infrastructure, you know, for, to take this proposition forward. Yeah. Thank you very much for this question. I think uh, we're just on very early stage of development of yeah. uh, uh, Sukuk market. So I think, uh, so locally, I think the main challenge is really uh, infrastructure and legislation. So in order to really treat Islamic financing product uh, in order to be equal and competitive to the con conventional finance. I think so we need some more amendments and we're working now with Islamic Development Bank uh, to amendments to the legislation just to bring the best uh, conditions to the uh, Islamic uh, financial products. In terms of international activities, you know that uh, the President Nazarbayev positioned Almaty like a regional financial center of Central Asia. So Central Asia, in the many years ago, was a global uh, trade hub. Uh, and when we, they captured it, this value added from the trade of uh, silk on an ancient silk road. And so right now we have a market of 70 million people. So the idea is to get these niches in Central Asia to position uh, like a, a development of uh, Islamic financing. In this terms, I think we will work uh, very closely with our Malaysian colleagues in terms of open some uh, win, uh, window for the Sukuk development in our stock exchange, and really, which really allow not only for the local, but uh, in more broader terms, all our neighboring area to issue uh, Sukuk bonds in Kazakhstan. 
And so, in fact, the Almaty is uh, very well positioned to resell. We have a direct flights to Kuala Lumpur. We have a direct flight to Dubai. And I think so this, that's also will cover it, the whole the space of the Central Asia and CIS region. Okay, thank you. Uh, Economic Secretary uh, Andrea Lidson, UK, as you alluded to in your speech, has achieved a lot over the last, especially last year or so. And I'm very encouraged to hear about the UKEF uh, uh, guarantee and also that the Bank of England is working on a Sharia compliant facility. Um, but uh, as, as a non-Muslim uh, uh, sort of jurisdiction for, Suku, uh, for, for, for Islamic finance, what do you think is the value added that Islamic finance can bring to the UK economy, not only in terms of uh, you know, the Muslim population there, but in terms of contributing to the economic growth of the UK mm. and by extension other European countries? Mm. For instance, I can allude to the National Infrastructure uh, Programme do you see the possibility of Sukuk uh, being engaged in financing at least some, uh, some aspects of our program? I mean, there was a lot of talk of Sukuk being involved in Crossrail, and there was a lot of disappointment that nothing happened in that respect. So where do you see, you know, in other words, what I'm trying to ask is, what is the life after the first made in UK Sukuk? Mm. Well, thank you. We were delighted to issue our sovereign Sukuk. We wanted it to demonstrate our commitment in the UK to the further development of Islamic finance. So it's been an incredibly important marker for us. And of course, what we want to see is that Islamic finance begins to rank alongside conventional finance. So the pricing of it is incredibly important. As Governor Zetti mentioned, very important that the pricing is at par. And our sovereign sukuk was issued at a price similar to um, to other sovereign issues. So that was very important to us. But where this goes in the future, we would like to see a broad range of financing capabilities in Islamic um, financing. So to include, as I mentioned, the development of Islamic insurance products, uh, we're certainly very keen. We're in the market for some big um, investments in UK infrastructure. I mentioned a couple, but there have been some quite significant um, investments already and there's much more to go there's a great deal of appetite in the UK but essentially what we want to do is to ensure that the UK becomes the Western hub for Islamic finance um, much as the UK is a very important if not the world's leading international financial center it's important to us that we look at all types of financing and Islamic financing is therefore very important thank you uh, Masood Ahmed I mean, I get the impression that the, the IMF World Bank Group, the importance is very understated. I don't think they realize the importance in uh, being the great enabler of the Islamic finance movement. Because there are countries, which are Muslim countries, that are not really active in it, but perhaps they need some encouragement from a multilateral such as the IMF and that. In that respect, I believe the IMF has set up this consultant, uh, consultative uh, committee. Can you sort of expand a bit on that and perhaps uh, a, a bit more where the IMF can be proactive, especially in terms of the financial stability aspects. Absolutely. Let, let me just make one uh, point first, if I might, uh, quickly, which is that in terms of public policy uh, you talked about, I think there, there are things that can be done relatively quickly and that are well identified. So it doesn't all have to wait for some long period to do. Simple things like how you record uh, sukuks in the budget. Simple things like uh, having a tax regime that does not, uh, that creates a level playing field between sukuks and conventional bonds. Uh, the UK, Luxembourg, Hong Kong have actually modified their tax laws in a way that avoids double taxation. So I think there are things that can be done and we need to be practical and pragmatic country by country to take that forward. Now, in terms of what the IMF can do more broadly, well, the IMF has been working with a lot of its members for a number of years now in providing training, uh, 
policy advice, uh, legal advice on, on technical issues relating to Islamic finance. What we are trying to do now is to actually use uh, the opportunity of uh, the development of the Islamic finance industry uh, and the pace at which it's developing to help create a, a momentum, to contribute more to the global discussion and, and uh, momentum. And that's why we've set up a international advisory group that actually has uh, the benefit also of Abdulaziz as, as one of the members of it. Uh, but this international advisory group is working with our own staff in trying to define an IMF uh, position on a variety of issues relating to Islamic finance and also how we can contribute. And the angle, as I said earlier, for us is that we are not regulators, we are not financial uh, market players, but we are the people who can help to bring together the Islamic finance industry and the mainstream and the financial sector, including Islamic finance, and the macroeconomic dimension, including the fiscal dimension. Because linking the fiscal consequences and the fiscal rules uh, for Islamic finance is a very important contribution that will help to advance this agenda. Final word from you. Very briefly. Okay, in terms of public policy, I think the playing field is not leveled. There's a biasness to conventional finance and therefore to bonds over the years. But as we can see, there is an interest now from the international institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, the other uh, Western economies on, on Islamic finance. So hoping that this playing field will be more leveled. And I really call up on IDB member countries, the three of them who are members in the G20, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Turkey, to do something with the G20 in trying to mainstream Islamic finance into the agenda of the G20. That is a very important thing to do. In terms of IDB, IDB will continue to work closely with its member countries. And I think we have achieved a lot in the past, whether for our own resource mobilization or for trying to reverse link what has been uh, done in a good way in our member countries. I think Malaysia is an example. Now we have uh, another example, which is uh, Dubai, especially in terms of governance and the financial centers. So IDB will try to do its best to help its member countries and reverse linking those good uh, examples. And IDB also have something to showcase investors, sovereign funds. IDB created a Sukuk fund that has now uh, reached $2.5 billion. We are investing in Sukuk. We are a very big investors in Sukuk. And the return in this fund is between 3 and 4%. And that proves the Sukuk investment in Sukuk is really a, a very good, a, could produce a very good return in this turbulent markets. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, basically just a quick wrap up. We've heard about the potential role of Islamic finance and Sukuk in towards uh, contributing to financial stability and of course towards development, the challenges in infrastructure. And we haven't even mentioned social Sukuk and financial inclusion and the SRI Sukuk. So, I uh, hope this will be opportunity for some other forums in the future because Sukuk, as you know, it's a huge, huge topic with huge potential and huge challenges as well. I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Governor Zetig, Governor Kalim Betov, uh, Economic Secretary Andrea Lenson, Masood Ahmed from the IMF and Abdulaziz al Hinai from the IDB. Thank them for their contributions and for your, uh, the audience for your participation. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that marks the end of our first session. We'll take a break now for 15 minutes. Please be back in your seats at 11.30 sharp so that we can begin the official opening ceremony. Thank you and see you after the break.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أصحاب الفخامة والمعالي والسعادة الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا بكم جميعا في دبي أرض الفرص والابتكارات والمركز العالمي الرائد للأعمال وعاصمة الاقتصاد الإسلامي نرحب بكم في افتتاح الدورة العاشرة للمنتدى الاقتصادي الإسلامي العالمي الذي يقام تحت شعار شراكات مبتكرة لمستقبل اقتصادي واعد وذلك في تجسيد لسعي الإمارة نحو لعب دور محوري في رسم ملامح جديدة للاقتصاد الإسلامي تماشيا مع مبادرة دبي عاصمة الاقتصاد الإسلامي التي أطلقها سيدي صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد آل مكتوم نائب رئيس الدولة رئيس مجلس الوزراء حاكم دبي حفظه الله أصحاب الفخامة والمعالي والسعادة إن أهمية المنتدى تكمن في تسليط الضوء على التغيرات الجوهرية التي تشهدها الأسواق المالية والتجارية العالمية كما أنه سيشكل منصة مثالية للمؤسسات والهيئات الاستثمارية الخاصة والحكومية لمد جسور التواصل وتبادل الخبرات والمعرفة مع خبراء الاقتصاد وما اجتماع هذه النخبة المتميزة من الحضور هنا في دبي إلا دليل على جاذبية الإمارة ومكانتها على الساحة الاقتصادية الإسلامية العالمية الحضور الكريم اسمحوا لي أن أدعو الآن سعادة تون موسى هيتام رئيس مؤسسة المنتدى الاقتصادي الإسلامي العالمي لإلقاء الكلمة الترحيبية بالضيوف فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. <coughs> His Excellency the Honorable Dr. Sri Najib Tun Raza, Prime Minister of Malaysia, His Excellency Presidents of Kazakhstan and Bangladesh, His Excellency Prime Ministers of Timor Leste and Luxembourg, and His Excellency Dr. Ahmad Muhammad Ali, President of the Islamic Development Bank. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. First of all, let me begin by saying how privileged I am to be standing before you today at this 10th WIEF being held in this beautiful and dynamic city of Dubai. I would like to express our appreciation to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum for giving his support to host our conference in Dubai. Let me say that since Dubai is aspiring to be the global hub of Islamic economy, we do hope that the holding of this year's annual forum in Dubai symbolically indicates our best wishes and confidence of your success. We also like to thank the Malaysian Prime Minister for his personal continued support, as well as his government's valuable assistance in making the WIEF the success that it is. In addition, I need also to recognize the presence of His Excellency Tun Abdullah Ahmad Badawi, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, who's with us, who started it all by establishing the WIEF more than 
10 years ago. I would also like to recognize the presence of His Excellency, the President of the Islamic Development Bank, who had been our very strong supporters from the very beginning. Our sincere thanks and sincere appreciation also go to the other global leaders present here today. Ladies and gentlemen, within the last 10 years, the WIEF annual fora had grown from a conference attended by just 400 business persons in Kuala Lumpur to 2,800 last year in London. Beside Kuala Lumpur, the annual conference had been held in Jakarta, Islamabad, Kuwait, Astana, London, and now Dubai, with an audience or attendance of 2,783 in the last count just now. And I'm sure within the coming few hours, it would break the London record. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, beside this annual conference, our smaller events, known as round tables, have been held in Istanbul, Moscow, Bahrain, New Delhi, Dhaka, London, Johannesburg, Madinah, Jakarta, and within the coming few months, Gangwon province in Korea, Cordoba, Spain, and Tokyo, will host roundtables in the name of the WIEF. We have also held special entrepreneur development programs for women and youth leadership networkings in different cities like Casablanca, Surabaya, Durban, Manila, Nairobi, Joe Baru and Kuching in Malaysia. The spread of our activities worldwide illustrates the WIEF's widening acceptability amongst not only the business communities, but significantly amongst the youth and women. More significantly is that more and more non-Muslim countries and their respective business communities, as well as their youth and women, are participating in our activities. Bearing in mind that there existed so much doubt about our then lifespan, some even giving us just three years to last at that time, and that we would be rejected by non-Muslim governments and their business communities, 10 years on, here, when I'm standing before you, we are still standing proudly and receiving an ever-continuing support. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The WIEF has been, from the start, insisting that we are a business forum. We are the platform as well as the facilitators for collaboration to better our business interests. We also give special focus on women, on youth, on the arts and culture, and on education. We would like to promote the attention of the world on smaller countries, and we need to give opportunities to small and medium enterprises. In so doing, we have managed to steer clear of raising issues that relate to religion or politics. And it cannot be denied that debates, discussions, and arguments on religion and political issues are an essential part of an ever-challenging world. We are convinced, however, that even taking into account the connectivity of religion, 
politics and economic development, there need to be increased serious attempts to bridge gaps by working on common denominators that could unite us all in order to decrease the chances of conflict. Especially considering that religious and sectarian conflicts seem more the order of the day, nowadays, it is my humble opinion that the most obvious common denominator is business collaboration through a win-win situation. Hard work, competition, yet with collaboration for profits is, to me, obviously the way, the WIEF way. At the same time, we need continuously to remind ourselves that business recognizes no boundary, no nationality, no race, no color, no creed. We need to build bridges with very strong, unshakable foundations, with webs of business connectivities covering the whole world. It is in this collective wish for success that, as chairman of the WIEF, I thank our leaders and all of you present here today for giving us continuing support. Before concluding, I would be failing in my duty if I did not mention with sincere thanks to three groups that is, the Dubai Chamber for partnering the WIEF Secretariat in the most active way. Then my colleagues in the International Advisory Panel of the WIEF. And last but not least, all staff members of both the WIEF and Dubai Chamber for their hard work and dedication. May Allah bless us all. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Shukran sa'adatukum. Walaan ismahu li an adwa ma'ali Muhammad bin Abdullah al-Girgawi, waziri shu'uni majlis al-wuzara'i fi dawlati al-Imarat al-Arabiya al-Muttahida, wa raisi majlis idarat markaz Dubai li tatwir al-iqtisad al-Islami, li ilqai kalimat dawlati al-Imarat. Fali yatafadhal, mashkuran. أصحاب الفقامة الرؤساء أصحاب المعالي والسعادة أيها الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نرحب بكم في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة ويسعدني أن أنقل لكم تحيات قيادة دولة الإمارات وترحيب شعبها الكريم بكم والتمنيات بالنجاح والتوفيق لمؤتمركم هذا أيها السيدات والسادة لقد أصبح الاقتصاد الإسلامي اليوم بنموه ثابت وأصوله المتزايدة وقاعدة عملاء المتزايدة ومبادئه وأصوله القويمة واقعا راسخا في النظام العالمي وقوة كبيرة مؤثرة في الاقتصاد الدولي وعاملا رئيسيا في تحقيق الازدهار للعديد من المجتمعات وليس يدل على ذلك من مشاركة أكثر من 140 دولة في هذا المؤتمر العالمي الكبير إن إيماننا العميق في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة بهمية الاقتصاد الإسلامي بدأت منذ بدايات هذه الدولة في السبعينيات حيث تم إنشاء أول بنك إسلامي في العالم وما زالت دولة الإمارات تحت القيادة الرشيدة لصاحب السمو الشيخ خليفة بن زايد آن نهيان رئيس الدولة حفظه الله وأخي صاحب السمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد المكتوب نائب رئيس الدولة رئيس مجلس وزراء حاكم دبي 
تقودنا في نفس الاتجاه وترسخ مكانتنا كعاصمة عالمية للاقتصاد الإسلامي وكمنصة لإطلاق العديد من المنتجات المالية الإسلامية الجديدة في مختلف قطاعات ومجالات الاقتصاد الإسلامي أيها السيدات والسادة لا يخفى عليكم أن العالم اليوم يعيش مجموعة من التوترات السياسية والكوارث الإنسانية والتراجعات التنموية الضخمة تقع أغلبها ضمن دائرة عالمنا الإسلامي كما لا يخفى عليكم بأن الغاية الرئيسية من الاقتصاد الإسلامي هو عمارة الأرض وتنميتها واستثمار خيراتها لتحقيق السعادة للمجتمعات وكذلك الخير للإنسان إن الفرص الاقتصادية الضخمة التي يوفرها الاقتصاد الإسلامي والشراكات الهائلة التي يمكن أن يخلقها والموارد الضخمة التي يمكن أن يسخرها لتحقيق الازدهار للمجتمعات كل ذلك يمكن أن يحقق مفتاحا لمزيد من الاستقرار والتنمية في عالمنا هذا نعم يمكننا تحقيق ذلك إذا أحسننا بناء الشراكات الخلاقة بيننا وتطوير أنظمة التعاون بين دولنا وابدعنا في تطوير خدمات إسلامية تتناسب مع التنمية في عصرنا إن قدرة الاقتصاد الإسلامي على تحقيق نمو ثابت في الدول غير الإسلامية له أكبر دليل على أننا نملك الحلول وكذلك الوسائل لتحقيق الكثير من التنمية في عالمنا الإسلامي ولعل هذا المؤتمر اليوم هو أحد الأدوات الرئيسية التي يمكننا من خلالها تطوير التعاون بين كافة دول العالم لإرسال رسالة حقيقية للعالم عن ديننا الإسلامي دين غايته عمارة الأرض وهدفه سعادة الإنسان وأولويته مصلحة المجتمعات في دولة الإمارات نحن نؤمن بمبادئ التعاون والتواصل والانفتاح والتسامح وهذا المؤتمر يحمل اليوم نفس هذه الروح ونفس المبادئ ونفس الغايات التي نسعى لها وكل ذلك يعطينا تفاؤلا بتحقيق نجاح استثنائي لهذا المؤتمر على أرض دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وفقنا الله والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكراً معالي الوزير الحضور الكريم يود الآن معالي داتو سري نجيب عبد الرزاق رئيس وزراء ماليزيا أن يشارككم رؤياه حول التمويل الإسلامي في ماليزيا من خلال هذا الفيديو Malaysia has long been a trading nation, blessed with rich natural resources, strategic location and a stable Islamic finance system, Malaysia has developed into a high-skilled, high-value-added economic powerhouse in Southeast Asia. We're a warm, friendly and vibrant nation, with strong political leadership, leading a stable and progressive economic environment putting us amongst the top 20% largest economies in the world today. We are a young nation, and like all young people, we have dreams, hopes and aspirations, and belief of a better future. That better future is to be a high-income, fully developed nation by 2020. No doubt, we are the pivot to Southeast Asia, facilitating access to a 600 million-plus ASEAN consumer market. Malaysia is strategically connected to other parts of the booming Asian region, particularly China and India, which serves as an ideal launchpad for investment in Asia. Malaysia is a pioneer of the modern Islamic finance industry and dominates global sukuk issuance, leveraging on our knowledge and experience in Islamic banking and finance. We are currently contributing to 11% of the world's research reports on Islamic finance through our dedicated and robust talents. Our Ijara and Wakala principles underlies the government's commitment towards developing and strengthening the local sukuk market. 
We have spread our resources across a broad range of industries, keeping a balanced, multi-sector portfolio that adds to our stable and steady economic progress. We've built world-class infrastructure and implemented internationally recognized regulatory and operating systems needed to support global multinational companies' operations and expansion in Southeast Asia. Malaysia is more than a regional economic powerhouse. We offer high living standards for the family, some of the best beaches and diving spots in the world, and a rich tapestry of culture and arts. So come to Malaysia to work, invest and play while living amongst a warm, multilingual, multi-religious population that has lived in harmony for hundreds of years to experience and benefit from the best in Asia. Malaysia, it's where the best of Asia comes alive. See you there. شاركوني الآن الترحيب بمعالي داتو سري نجيب تون عبد الرزاق رئيس وزراء ماليزيا والراعي لمؤسسة المنتدى الاقتصادي الإسلامي العالمي إلى المسرح لإلقاء كلمته فليتفضل مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and a very good afternoon your excellencies presidents of Kazakhstan Bangladesh prime ministers of Timor Leste Luxembourg president of IDB Yamar Bahagatul Musahitam chairman of the World Islamic Economic Forum Foundation Yamar Bahagia to Nabla Badawi, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Your Highnesses, <coughs> Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is an honour to be here for the 10th World Islamic Economic Forum. I would like to especially thank His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum for his personal support in making this happen. This, the first WIEF in the Middle East. In the past 10 years, the forum has brought thinkers and leaders together to talk about big issues, issues that we face together from food security to economic development. The success of WIEF is also due to the leadership role played by Tun Musahitam and the Secretariat of WIEF. I wish to congratulate Tun Musa and his team for their tireless effort in making WIEF what it is today, a forum with immense global recognition. I would be remiss not to acknowledge the role of my predecessor, Tun Abdullah Badawi, who provided the much-needed support and impetus, especially in the early years of the inception of WIEF. Thank you, Tun, for your support, your continued support in the past and in the present. Ladies and gentlemen, this year our theme is Innovative Partnerships for economic growth. I know WIEF have an impressive set of speakers lined up to talk about everything from design to development economics. But today, I would like to talk about a partnership, a partnership that is essential for growth, a partnership that involves public, private, and third sectors, a partnership that makes human and economic development possible, and that is education. 
Ladies and gentlemen, education is central to our history. Indeed, the first word Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was Ikrak or read. In a golden age of Islam, the world's first universities, the Bayt al Hikmah in Baghdad and al Karawiyyin in Fez, were established in Muslim lands. From Cairo to Cordoba, scholars around the world came to Islamic capitals to engage in study, in translation and discourse, preserving works from antiquity and advancing human knowledge in everything from astronomy to geography. For centuries, Muslims led the world of learning. But despite notable successes, we, did not turn this strong start into a lasting legacy. Today, too few Muslims are able to read or write, according to the Islamic Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Illiteracy rates in some Muslim countries reach 40% for men and 65% for women. Our tradition of pioneering science did not produce a generation of modern scientific leaders. Only two Muslims have won the Nobel Prize for chemistry or physics. We have the world's oldest universities, but few of the world's best. An organization of the Islamic conference countries spend just a third of the global average on research and development. The end result is that too many Muslims are missing out on opportunities, and too many Muslim nations are missing their greatest assets, their people. Ladies and gentlemen, by prioritizing education throughout life, we can realize the potential of our people, reducing poverty, raising living standards, and unlocking 21st century growth. We need new, we need innovative partnerships between educators, governments, private and third sectors to make good the gap. The starting point is literacy, the foundation for success. According to the World Literacy Foundation, illiteracy costs the world economy more than $1 trillion a year. But the human cost is greater still. A child born to a literate mother is 50% more likely to live past the age of five. We should unite behind the Islamic educational, scientific and cultural organizations call to use all means available to ensure our people can read, write, and contribute to national economic and social development. We should follow the example of Arab states whose adult literacy has risen by 20% in the past 20 years, or Southeast Asian nations where literacy rates are consistently above 90%. Alongside efforts to improve adult and youth literacy, we should continue to focus our policies and resources on schooling, primary and secondary education, is the standard that makes achievement possible. UNESCO reports suggest that each year of additional schooling increases a person's earnings by up to 10% and GDP growth by 0.37%. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the world's most courageous education activists is a Muslim, the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Laureate Malala Yusuf Zai, who has drawn global attention to the struggles that some girls still face in assessing education. We should honor her inspiring courage and work by continuing to focus on providing quality primary and secondary education for all our citizens, preventing young people from dropping out of school and working with countries with sizable Muslim minorities to understand why some Muslim communities are underachieving 
while others are flourishing. We can also do more to build up the quality and capacity of our higher education system as technology spreads further in the workplace, creating new sectors and careers. Countries are competing to create strong, knowledge-driven economies. That includes scientific knowledge, where countries like Turkey and Iran have made significant leaps forward. By investing in research and supporting scientific study, countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia help build strong reputations and even stronger results. And when it comes to encouraging new technology sectors, our hosts, Dubai, have led the way, making the digital economy one of the pillars of the economic policy. Often, the conversation about education stops at the university level. But we can also do more, and we must do more, to encourage a culture of lifelong learning. That includes postgraduate and vocational technical programs in speciality areas. Malaysia, which issued the world's first sovereign sukuk, has made a strategic decision to focus on Islamic finance with institutions and courses designed to train professionals in this fast-growing sector. Ladies and gentlemen, meeting these objectives will require innovative partnership between private sector education providers, governments and communities. But by making education a priority from early years to later life, we can unlock new opportunities for our people, new human resource for our businesses, and new growth for our nations. I thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Your Excellency. Shukran ma'alikum. Ashaba al-Sumu wal-Fakhamati wal-Sa'ada. Liqa'a musahamatihi al-Bariza fi tatwiri al-Khadamati al-Masrifiyya al-Islamiyya al-Alamiyya. Wa ta'zizi mabadi al-Tamwil al-Islami fi mantiqat Asia al-Wusta. Wa kathalika mubadaratihi li-inshai bank al-Hilal ka awwal bank al-Islami fi Kazakhstan. رشح جائزة التمويل الإسلامي الدولي فخامة الرئيس نور سلطان نزار بايف رئيس جمهورية كازغستان لنيل جائزة القائد العالمي في مجال التمويل الإسلامي نستقبل الآن فخامة الرئيس نور سلطان نزار بايف رئيس جمهورية كازغستان على المسرح لإلقاء كلمته فليتفضل مشكورا Уважаемые коллеги, дамы и господа, участники форума, тема нынешнего Всемирного исламского экономического форума – инновационное партнерство для экономического роста. Это особенно актуально сегодня, и только что выступивший передо мной премьер-министр Малайзии господин Розак очень подробно и глубоко об этом рассказал. На фоне наблюдаемого нами мирового финансово-экономического кризиса экономический рост в странах является важным фактором стабильности в государствах и развития экономик. Члены Организации Исламского Сотрудничества сегодня контролируют 70% мировых энергетических ресурсов и экспортируют 40% минерального сырья. Однако на страны организации приходится только 7,5 мирового внутреннего валового продукта и только 11,2% от общего объема глобального торгового оборота. Это говорит о низости производительности труда в наших странах и неразвитости современной экономики. Требуется решительное сотрудничество и принятие необходимых инициатив для того, чтобы достойно встретить и преодолеть глобальные вызовы. 
Мусульманский мир сегодня сталкивается с рядом серьезных проблем, таких как рост народонаселения, бедности, постепенное исчерпание природных ресурсов, ухудшение экологии. В ходе председательства Казахстана в Организации Исламского Сотрудничества была принята Астанинская декларация этой организации, направленная на модернизацию и реформы в качестве основ развития исламского мира в 21 веке. С этой позиции Казахстан остается твердым сторонником дальнейшего укрепления и развития исламского мира. Как вам известно, независимости нашей 22 года. После развала Советского Союза на карте мира появился новая страна Казахстан, пожалуй, самая северная страна, где более 70% населения являются мусульманами. За это короткое время от полной распада и упадка остановленной экономики мы прошли большой путь, увеличив нашу экономику за эти годы в 16 раз. От 500 долларов на душу населения до 13,5 тысяч. Мы гордимся этими достижениями, и мы вернулись в исламскую мусульманскую уму, мы вернулись к своей религии, мы многонациональная страна, уважающая все религиозные конфессии, все этносы, все языки, все культуры. Стабильность многонационального Казахстана, где проживают более 100 наций, 46 религиозных конфессий, служит хорошим примером для развития современного общества. Казахстан последовательно реализует намеченные приоритеты по созданию альтернативной экономики, инновационной, индустриальной, хотя Казахстан является богатейшей страной по ресурсам, как нефти и газа, и других элементов Менделеева, которые экспортируются сегодня. Мы говорим по созданию системы продовольственной взаимопомощи, механизма поддержки среднего и малого бизнеса. В рамках осуществляемой нашей страной новой индустриальной программы мы начали активно работать с нашими партнерами, такими как Объединенные Арабские Эмираты, Иран, Турция, Малайзия. Объем инвестиций этих стран сегодня превышает более 3 миллиардов долларов США. Работает у нас более 15 перспективных проектов на сумму 2,5 миллиардов долларов США. И это только начало. Казахстан создает все условия для привлечения инвесторов. Создается транспортно-логистическая инфраструктура. Построена и реконструирована за эти годы более 10 тысяч километров автомобильных дорог, 2,5 тысячи километров железных дорог. Расстояние от Китая до Персидского залива сокращено на 1200 километров. Будучи государством, находящимся внутри материка, не имеющего выхода к морям, мы стремимся построить добрые отношения с восточным соседем Китайской Народной Республики, с которой имеем 1700 километров границ, на севере с Россией, с которой у нас более 7000 километров общих границ. Город Алматы станет ключевым звеном глобального проекта возобновляемого Великого Шелкового Пути, который соединит Тихий океан через Китай и Западную Европу. Казахстан может стать глобальным центром продовольственной безопасности. Общая площадь земель сельскохозяйственного назначения в Казахстане составляет 90 миллионов гектаров. Из них 25 миллионов гектаров относятся к пахотным землям и 61 миллион гектар к пастбищам. Мы сегодня уже экспортируем до 10 миллионов тонн продовольственной пшеницы. Инвестиции в сельскохозяйственную отрасль, возможности новой техники привело бы к увеличению производства продовольственной продукции в три раза. Здесь большое поле деятельности для исламского финансирования и привлечения ваших инвестиций в нашу страну. Большое значение для нас имеет работа с Исламским банком развития. Казахстан был первым среди всех государств бывшего Советского Союза, разработавшим программу партнерства с Исламским банком развития. Инвестировано более 700 миллионов долларов. Исламский банк развития 
участвуют в новой программе сотрудничества с международными финансовыми организациями, составлена программа на 2015-2017 годы на сумму 13,5 миллиардов американских долларов. Сумма участия банка исламского составляет более полутора миллиардов. Помимо привлечения финансовых средств, институты группы Исламского банка развития оказывают значительную консультативную помощь в развитии Исламского банкинга в Казахстане. В 2007 году мы с его величеством президентом Объединенных Арабских Эмиратов шейхом Халифой бен Зиядом Аль-Нахаяном приняли совместное решение об открытии первого Исламского банка Аль-Халяр в Казахстане с капитализацией 500 миллионов долларов США. Мы позиционируем наш крупнейший город Алматы как региональный хаб исламского финансирования для стран СНГ и Восточной Европы. Принято соответствующее законодательство, работают исламские инвести... инструменты. Активное участие Казахстана во внедрении и развитии исламского финансирования отмечено присуждением международной премии номинации «Глобальный лидер в сфере исламских финансов», за что я хотел бы искренне поблагодарить форум и вас всех, дорогие друзья. Я хочу поблагодарить за то, что Казахстан, я как президент страны впервые принимаю участие на таком форуме. Я думаю, мы в последующих мероприятиях будем принимать постоянное и более активное участие. Совместно с нашими партнерами мы продолжим усилия по расширению принципов Исламского банка. Уважаемые участники форума, убежден, что участники юбилейной Всемирного Исламского форума внесут свою лепту в переосмысление измерений мировой экономики. Желаю вам плодотворной работы, результатов хороших, интересных и открытых дискуссий. Спасибо. Всего доброго. رحبوا معي الآن بفخامة الرئيس محمد عبد الحميد رئيس جمهورية بنجلادش ليلقي كلمته فليتفضل مشكورا Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, distinguished chairman of WIF, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Let me congratulate UAE for convening the World Islamic Economic Forum. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the people and the government of UAE and of Dubai deserves our sincere appreciation for a most warm welcome and hospitality, hospitality accorded. The forum continues to highlight a range of contemporary economic and social issues facing the Muslim world. The forum provides a useful space for us to interact on innovative ideas and knowledge with the rest of the world. The theme of this forum is timely. The global community is now discussing a global development agenda for the next 15 years. There, Bangladesh has emphasized on the importance of securing dignity, well-being, and inclusion of people in the future development frameworks. Our experience could be noteworthy. Bangladesh reduced poverty from 57 in 1991 to just under 
25 today, 25 percent today. During the last four years, our average GDP grow at over 6 percent. In spite of limited resources and many challenges, Bangladesh has met six of the MDGs, homegrown innovation and mobilization and utilization of local resources we are behind our success and reliance. We believe development of people's skill, knowledge, capacities in a knowledge-based global society is critical for achieving sustainable development. In that context, driven by our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's vision 2021 of emerging as a middle-income country by 2021. Bangladesh is striving for quality education for all, empowerment of women and the digital Bangladesh, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the world commands sustain, substantial knowledge, resources, and capabilities to grow further. We see rapid changes in dynamic and growth pattern in global manufacturing and service sectors. Information and communication technologies offer a scope for further innovation and changes. At the same time, we face increasing challenges, risks, and vulnerabilities. Gaps between countries and communities are also widening inequality, poverty, deprivation, hunger, diseases, and indignity still concern mass of the Muslim world. Climate change also risks mass of our precious development gains. So the world needs new creative approach and development pathways to balance the opportunities and challenges. The eight trillion dollar global Islamic economy would need to consider innovative and new ways to fast track sustainable development in our countries. Let me underline a few practical aspects that the forum should build upon. First, our countries need robust, effective, and need-based international support. It, in terms of accessibility, development, finance, market access, investment, capacity building, and technology. Countries like Bangladesh also require an enabling global environment to meaningfully reap the benefits of globalized movement of goods, services, investment, finance, trade, knowledge, people. Second, majority of the populous countries in the Islamic world need support in creating adequate productive capacity and developing critical infrastructure. Third, technology is a key factor to determine our country's development in the future. Low-income countries like Bangladesh should get easier access to life-saving technologies in health, agriculture, food, climate change, IPR restrictions must be addressed. Our efforts to develop adaptive technologies should be fully supported. Fourth, in a knowledge-based global economy, our countries would need to pay greater focus on science, technology, innovation. This has to be beyond the way we currently undertake resources planning across relevant sectors like education, employment. Fifth, Muslim world is not homogeneous in terms of level of social and economic development. Many of our countries are low income and LDCs. 
Some are also climate vulnerable. Their circumstances and risks are unique. They, their needs and issues should be particularly kept in view in any form of partnership. Sixth, new actors and sources can bring a new knowledge and resources to address our development challenges, including private sector. But all new and innovative resources and actors should bring in practicable and additional resources in providing social goods and address complex developmental challenges. Bangladesh would stress that any innovative partnership must be based on mutual trust, mutual respect and understanding, mutually, mutuality of interest, mutual benefit and equitable sharing of benefits. Meeting these objectives is crucial for securing balanced, broad-based partnership. The global discussion on the post-2015 agenda has underlined these. We have supported stand-alone goals on inclusive economic growth, industri industrialization, employment, and jobs, unlike any time in the past. Re realization of the new agenda should ask that each actor and stakeholder fulfill respective commitments and actions. The post-2015 agenda is universal. It would impact on the all actors and stakeholders, including trade, finance, and investment. As the forum considers new development models and tools, this needs to be taken into account. Private sector investment and finance community in the Muslim world should priori prioritize their actions accordingly and may focus on some of the emerging areas. We support the forum in considering new development narrative framework and tools of cooperation. Our people and their well-being will have to be at the center of any innovative partnership for inclusive growth framework. The forum has the potential to lead the world in that endeavor and start with modest piloting of a few sustainable solutions in addressing the development challenges in the Islamic world. I wish the forum all success to this end. I thank you all. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Your Excellency. Shukran fakhamatukum. والآن مع كلمة معالي زفي بتل رئيس وزراء لوكسمبورغ فليتفضل مشكورا. Your Highness, dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me express my gratitude for the invitation to participate to the 10th World Islamic Economic Forum here in Dubai, a city which shows the United Arab Emirates' successful approach in pioneering new paths of development and innovation. This forum will not only allow all of us to explore the future of Islamic finance and economy, but it represents an excellent opportunity to deepen existing relationships and to enhance economic, trade, and cultural partnerships. I would like to congratulate the organizers of the Forum for the 10th anniversary of the event. From a modest beginning in 2004, look at what we stand today. An international event of this size and standing, bringing together leaders of the Muslim and non-Muslim world speaks for itself. We have a unique opportunity and responsibility to create bridges 
and partnerships between all of us for the better good of our societies. Let me express my thanks to our gracious host, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, for giving us the opportunity in Dubai, a city which symbolized the crossroads and the coming together of cultures and people. While techno technological developments have revolutionized our means of communication and have dramatically accelerated globalization, I would like to reaffirm the necessity of dialogue on our cooperation. We need to constantly evaluate our current relations, to agree on new visions, and to develop new innovative partnerships for growth, for economic growth, which is the very timely topic of this year's forum. All of us face tremendous challenges, and we need to constantly adapt to the dynamics of new political realities and socio-economic developments. This means that we sometimes have to re-engineer relations and identify new strategic partnerships so as to ensure continued economic development. But we also have to ensure that this development remains sustainable and does not come at the cost of destroying our natural habitat. The 21st century confronts us with challenges that will define our future. Only a wise management of our planet in the face of climate change, the depletion of natural resource, and a rising population will guarantee prosperity, stability, and peace for future generations. In our modern world, economic development thrives through interdependence. Growth in one country also brings growth to other countries. It is a virtuous circle and a win-win situation, as long as it is guided by a framework of sustainable policies. Participants of the forum will mainly talk about finance and economy over the next two days. The financial sector, including the Islamic financial sector, has indeed a major role to play by supporting innovative and future-oriented sectors and do promote green growth. Over the past decades, many countries have achieved unprecedented progress in economic development and have lifted millions of people out of poverty. More and more young people have access to education and will contribute to further development of their own country. Modern communication technology allows for an almost instant exchange of knowledge, information and opinion all over the globe. Our young generations grow up in an interconnected global but also unfair world, which sometimes lead to discontent and frustration. Political leaders need to embrace these new realities in our societies and ensure that people can live their lives in a tolerant, fair and secure environment without discrimination of any kind. The European Union is a success story in this regard. It testifies that political vision, combined with economic integration, leads to a current identity where free trade, free flow of capital, labor and people, combined with technological advancement, leads to prosperity, stability and peace. Luxembourg has been a founding member of the European Union. As a small country, we always understood about interdependency, the need for cooperation, and the need to be able to compete with much stronger and much larger countries. Yeah, there are some. Luxembourg's very open economy and its welcome stance towards business and foreign investments has allowed us to develop into a major financial center in Europe, acting as a center of excellence for international finance, offering fiscal and regulatory stability and predictability. Ladies and gentlemen, we have all gathered here in Dubai to explore the future of Islamic finance and economy. I'm proud to tell you that Luxembourg has also been a pioneer of Islamic finance in Europe. We were the first country in Europe to authorize an Islamic financial institute in the 70s. We were to the first to list a sukuk in 2002. 
We were the first European Central Bank to join the Islamic Financial Service Board based in Kuala Lumpur in 2010, whose summit Luxembourg hosted in 2011. And most recently, we were the first country to issue sovereign sukuk denominated in euro. What was it that pushed, pushed a country like Luxembourg to embrace the Islamic economy early on? As I just mentioned, Luxembourg landlocked between Germany, France, and Belgium, in the heart of Europe, has always been at the crossroads with its neighbors and beyond. Size and location, but also the leadership, have made the country embrace the values of peace, tolerance, and openness to other cultures. We have had excellent relations with many countries from this region for a long time. Economic, business, but also personal ties made it natural for us to diversify the offer of our products so as to respond to a growing interest of Islamic investors. More and more people are looking for alternative and responsible investment opportunities, not only focusing on returns, but on a cleaner energy, a greener environment, and a more equitable development. Luxembourg, recognizing this desire of investors to be reassured of the wise use of their funds, has created a label, LuxFlag, awarded to investment funds investing directly or indirectly in the responsible investment sector. Islamic finance has been developing rapidly over the last years and will continue to grow. More players are becoming active in this area. It is important to exchange information, best practice, and to learn from each other. This is what Luxembourg has been doing for a long time. And the Luxembourg Supervisory Authority for the Financial Sector has signed cooperation agreements with a number of supervisory authorities of partner countries in Islamic finance. They include the Dubai, Dubai Financial Service Authority, the Central Bank of Bahrain, the Securities Commission of Malaysia, the Emirates Securities and Commodities Authority, the Qatar Financial Center Regulation Authority, and the Egyptian Financial Supervisory Authority. It is only through cooperation that Luxembourg has managed to create a business environment geared towards the needs of Islamic finance practitioners and thus to develop into one of the leading Islamic finance centers in Europe, being among others to the largest number of Islamic investment funds in Europe. Reliability, predictability, and stability are key to create an attractive business environment, but so are innov innovation and reactivity to new challenges. Our government works in close relationship with industry and business to identify, understand, and find solutions to these challenges. It is only in partnership with the private sector that the country has developed poles of excellence like IT, satellites, financial technology, data center management, and logistic. Located at the heart of Europe, Luxembourg is the ideal gateway to European market with 500 million plus consumers. The country has been striving to be at the forefront of economic and technological development. We are dedicated to fostering innovative yet lasting partnerships around the world in order to strengthen growth and development for all of us and to promote cooperation, tolerance and understanding. I know that we share this approach and I'm convinced that it will allow us to build a sustainable future. Luxembourg is also committed to continue working together with the World Islamic Economic Forum. With this in mind, let me wish you a fruitful discussions in the coming days. I will be looking forward to hear about the outcomes of this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, before closing, I would like to congratulate the United Arab Emirates for having been chosen to host the World Expo 2020 in Dubai. This will be the first time that the World Expo will be staged in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia region, which is a testimony to the leadership of this country. I'm convinced that the World Expo, like today's World Islamic Economic Forum, will further contribute to a constructive and positive dialogue and lead to a better understanding among the world community. The World Expo theme, Connecting Minds, Creating the Future, 
underlines the spirit of partnership and cooperation that has driven the United Arab Emirates' success in pioneering new paths of development and innovation. Thank you very much for your attention. Shukran. Thank you, Your Excellency. Shukran ma'alikum. Al-Hudur al-Kareem. رحبوا معي الآن بمعالي شنانا كسماو رئيس وزراء تيمور الشرقية ليلقي كلمته فليتفضل مشكورا Your Highness, Excellencies, Head of States and Government Ministers, distinguished guests, participants, wassalamu alaikum, peace is upon you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Makun, Vice President and Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates and the ruler of Dubai, for inviting me to participate in this international event and for the warm hospitality given to me and to my delegation. I also commend my Southeast Asian good friend, the Honorable Dato Sri Najib Tun Abdul Razak, Prime Minister of Malaysia, for his ongoing support of this important forum and my respect to the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. It is indeed a great honor and privilege uh, to address this esteemed audience uh, today at the 10th World Is Islamic Economic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, Timor-Leste is a small and very young nation in the crossroads of Asia and Pacific. The Portuguese came to my country 500 years ago in search of sandalwood and spices. As a result, today we are a predominantly Catholic country with strong cultural ties to Portugal. My country is a half of, a, of an island with the other half belonging to Indonesia, a country with the largest Muslim population in the world. In 1975, following Portugal's decision to withdraw from all its colonies, our country was invaded by Indonesia with military support from Western countries. A difficult 24-year struggle began as we fought for our independence and our freedom. We fought a war across our land, but even with a loss of more than 200,000 lives in a population of less than 1 million, never we became the newest nation of the world. Our first government was led by Prime Minister Dr. Marie Bin Amoud al Khatiri, a Muslim Timorese who campaigned tirelessly during decades of exile for our rights to self-determination. When we achieved our freedom, even though we were desperately poor and without infrastructure or social services, we made reconciliation with Indonesia our number one priority. It was not easy, as we had to embrace forgiveness, but both nations decided to purposefully look forward rather than back. I have come today, at a time of global upheaval and conflict, to share with you our story of reconciliation and friendship. It is a story of hope and the promise of partnership between the Muslim and the non-Muslim world. As part of the world are torn apart by intolerance and vengeance, Indonesia and Timor-Leste stand out as a shining example of reconciliation and peace building. 
and as a model for partnerships between Muslim and non-Muslim nations, we have proved that while it may be easier to exploit differences and to feed fear and provoke hostility, real courage is to forgive and to forge relationships of friendships and cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Timor-Leste is also fortunate, like many countries in this region, to be rich in petroleum resources. Being 12 years old, we face many challenges and are still one of the poorest countries in our region, which is why we are determined to manage our petroleum resources prudently and transparently to develop our country and to save for future generations. This transparency has not been a barrier to growing our economy. Since I came to office in 2007, Timor-Leste has enjoyed, on average, double-digit